going to be connected. In the same way that in Plato's Republic, politics was ethics writ large, and what was good for the individual soul, the gold, silver, and bronze, that ordering of the soul between reason, spirit, and desire, What's good for the soul is the same thing that's good for the city, to have rational people running the government, like Marcus Aurelius, doing their best to follow the philosophical life. You'll want bravery and fortitude and courage among your soldiers, the silver virtues, and among the rest of the people, you expect the bronze virtues. They want to eat and drink and make merry. It would be nice if we could make philosophers all, of all of them, but if we can't, well, the best thing we can do is to take care of them and prevent misfortunes from befalling them, in some respects to try and save them from themselves. Now... Marcus Aurelius is the only example of this in Roman culture. There's not a great deal of things that we can compare him to. If we had to say that there was someone to compare him to, it would be Epictetus, the slave. And Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius could meet at a level of equality, even though the social distinctions between them are enormous and grave. The reason why they would meet at a level of equality because they could share mutual respect because they both understand that to have an orderly soul is the key thing in human life. And that's what makes life worth living. And whether you happen to be a slave or an emperor doesn't make any difference. Whether you happen to be sick or healthy doesn't make any difference. Whether you happen to be just born and have a hundred years ahead of you, or whether you're on your deathbed doesn't make any difference. Marcus says with regard to death, because many people are afraid of death, and he has no understanding. He doesn't really understand what, the, what everybody else's problem is. He says, look, everyone dies, so you're going to die. So what's the point of complaining about it? I can understand trying to avoid it. I mean, health is a good thing, but when you're going to die, you're going to die. Don't give in to fear. Don't give in to irrational musings. Don't let your imagination run wild. Control your feelings. Control your emotions. Control that part of you which is you, the meat your body, not so important. The other stuff around you in the world, a matter of indifference to you. As long as you follow the way of nature, as long as you act in a rational fashion, as long as you live up to the best potentials in the human soul, then you are a good man and you need worry about nothing else. Some people worry about the gods, that the gods will cause you misfortunes, that the gods have a Hades or a hell or an afterlife where people will be tortured and have bad things done to them. Marcus adopts exactly the same position that Socrates did. He says, look, Marcus, or Marcus says, I'm not certain if there are gods. In, many of, in, the, in the book itself, he says, I'm not aware of any rational proof that there exist gods, and I'm not aware of any rational proof that there are no gods. In other words, he's agnostic in that respect. But he takes a position rather like that of Blaise Pascal, and he says, let's think about what the implications are if God exists, and let's think about what the implications are if he doesn't exist, and let's see if we can find one way of acting that will satisfy both contingencies logical guy. And he says, well, if the gods don't exist and the world is just atoms and the void, if you think back to Professor Staloff's lecture about early primitive physical theories, well, we have atoms in the void, uh, homogeneous stuff called matter, and then the space that it moves around in. Well, if there are no gods and there is no moral order to the world and we're just atoms in the void, well, then what difference does it make what happens to you or anybody else? So you come into being, you go out of being. So what? You, you get healthy, you get sick, so what? There's nothing to get excited about because, well, it's just atoms in the void. Don't be afraid of it. It is what it is. There's nothing to be afraid of. You could say that Roman Stoicism is a way of telling people there's nothing to be afraid of. Nothing can happen to you in nature that is not a part of nature. And nature contains nothing fearful for the rational soul. Now let's take the other half of the Pascalian alternative. Let's consider the proposition that there are gods or a god. It doesn't matter whether it's monotheistic or polytheistic. If there are gods, then they must be rather like the gods of Socrates. They are all good, they are all wise, they are all completely moral and completely virtuous and completely knowing and completely excellent. Would creatures like this do anything bad to you? Well, maybe they would. Maybe if you've been doing bad stuff, maybe there is something actually in store for you later on. There may well be a Hades. Gods like that may want to create moral order in the world and dish out to the bad people of the world just what they have coming to them. But suppose, hypothetically, you lived according to reason and according to nature and according to the universal law of the Logos. Would the gods hurt a man like that, or would a man like that be a friend of the gods? And if a man like that would be dealt with fairly by the gods, justly by the gods, and well by the gods, the gods will do you no harm. So there are two possibilities. Either the world is atoms in the void, the world is just stuff, in which case there's nothing to be afraid of because you're just part of that stuff and you might as well go along with the flow. Relax. Enjoy the ride. Nothing to be scared of, nothing to get excited about. On the other hand, and this, I suspect, 
deep down in Marcus is what he really believes. I mean, when you just read between the lines and find out what the man himself is like, he does basically believe in the gods, even though he doesn't know if he had to place a wager either way, the same way as Pascal, but perhaps not for the same reasons, he would say, yes, I believe in the gods. And if the gods exist, then they create moral order, and they are perfectly moral themselves, and they are perfectly just and good and righteous themselves, and they will do you no harm. So if there is an afterlife and you behave well, the gods will do you no harm because you deserve no harm done to you. If there is an afterlife and you behave badly, you have no one to blame but yourself. In every case, the only thing that a man is in control of is the individual ego, himself, the, the cogito, what, what Descartes will later on call the cogito, the self. If you are in control of that, if you have an orderly soul, then you have a divine soul, a good soul, and your life is worth living. The gods will not penalize you for that. So, what's there to worry about? Don't worry, be happy. Either the, stu either the world is atoms in the void, nothing to worry about. If the gods are there, well then the gods certainly aren't going to hurt you. Either way, don't worry, be happy. Do what you know you ought to do. Meet your moral obligations. In some respect, and I think that this is worth taking notes on if you happen to be here at the Kant lecture next week, or two weeks from now, is that the Stoic conception of virtue is an anticipation of what I will call the Kantian conception of virtue. Those of you who are familiar with the works of Immanuel Kant can recognize the single-minded and ruthless acquirement of virtue as being the Kantian conception of, of moral action or good moral behavior and the Stoic conception as well. Both Kant and Marcus Aurelius have achieved the greatness that comes from being aware that virtue is sufficient in itself. The single-minded pursuit of rationality, of justice, of temperance, of fortitude is what this book is all about.